Is this a good uh, font size? Wait, wait, wait. I'm changing as I go. OK. I see. As I was asking the question, I tried to improve because I knew it probably wasn't good enough. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so like I, I would say traditionally, many of the constructions in symplectic contact topology, geometry, have been very geometric. They've relied on fairly special procedures. Um, and they've produced kind of contact symplectic structures with a lot of rich invariance. On the other hand, H principles are you know, an example of symplectic flexibility. They're very much a topological phenomenon, and um, kind of all underlying symplectic information gets killed under the H principle. Um, so you would think that, okay, on the H principle, you know, it's like useless to construct any interesting symplectic or contact structures. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to try to convince you that's not the case, that H principles are actually quite useful for constructing interesting symplectic and contact structures. So, let me begin by reviewing a bit. So I'm mostly going to talk about the symplectic side of this. At the end, I'll get a little bit to the contact side, but the constructions are very much now. Because so Weinstein domain, just a call. So you have M, an exact symplectic manifold with um, contact boundary and you have an isotropic sphere lambda k inside this boundary um, so this is kind of the geometric condition and this the isotropic condition implies that k is at most n so half the dimension and then Weinstein showed how to kind of attach a handle to this isotropic sphere form, which something I'll denote M union K. This is the handle. This is a new exact symplectic manifold, also with contact boundary. So picture you should have in mind. You have M. You have isotropic sphere, lambda, and you have, you have the handle. So in this whole thing, I'm going to know by M union. Okay. So note that you can iterate this procedure, right? If I have this uh, new exact simplex manifold contact boundary, I find a new isotropic sphere. I can repeat the procedure. And definition, a Weinstein domain. is what you get by it's obtained by successive Weinstein handle attachment to the ball with the standard symplectic structure, which you could think of as a zero, zero handle. So this is symplectic handle body, like you start with the ball, you find an isotropic sphere, you find a new isotropic sphere, you attach a handle, keep going. So, symplectic handle body. This is the view on Weinstein domains that I'll have in mind. And like smooth handle bodies, there's a notion of handle moves, which is called the Weinstein homotopy. So these are essentially, these are handle moves. So they're something like a handle slide for these. There's handle creation, and there's handle cancellation. I'll say a little bit about these moves later. And 
the Weinstein homotopy, kind of two Weinstein domains, which are Weinstein homotopic, meaning you do these handle moves, their completions are symplectomorphic. So the symplectic topology doesn't change under these moves. So that's nice that we can just kind of study Weinstein domains in terms of the, the attaching spheres, these isotropic and Legendre detaching spheres, and then we do it up to these handle moves. So do the easiest non-trivial example. There's standard cotangent model of a sphere, which has a Weinstein presentation. As you start with the B2N, the standard structure, you have this Legendrian unknot. I've drawn it in its front projection, and you attach a handle. So this is the Legendrian unknot. So it's a specific unknot. So Legendrian, I mean, uh, isotropic in the maximal case when uh, k is equal to n. Some Legendrian unknot in the standard contact sphere. So that's the presentation for the standard cotangent below the sphere. There's another Weinstein structure, also on the underlying smooth domain, which is called the flexible cotangent below the sphere. And that's, again, you start with a ball, but instead of looking at the Legendrian unknot, you look at the stabilized version of it. So basically, that means the front projection has a zigzag. So the zigzag is actually like, very important, but you can treat it as a black box. It's the same thing, but just a zigzag. And it's what's called a loose Legendrian unknot. So I change the attaching spheres, and the domains change. Uh, let me mention that these domains are um, formally symplectomorphic. So formally symplectomorphic, I mean, they basically have the same underlying smooth topology and the same underlying bundle of theoretic data. So, so these two structures, they're homotopic through non-degenerate two forms. the two forms might not be closed. This is just some algebraic topological condition, um, but, but they're not symplectomorphic. Um, so this is an example of exotic symplectic structures in the same smooth domain. Kind of from the point of view of smooth topology, everything is the same, because smooth topology just sees the non-degeneracy of the two form, that pointwise condition. From the symplectic point of view, there's something interesting, and the way they're distinguished is symplectic homology. Of the standard one is non-zero. Symplectic homology of the flexible one is zero. And symplectic homology is a symplectic invariant of the completion. So you use some geomorphic curves to show that these domains, while being smoothly the same, are not symplectically the same. Um, okay, so that's, I'm going to erase this dinner sign. I hope everyone's taken notes. You mentioned another collection of examples, which are much more intricate. They're due to Mark McLean. And they exist infinitely many Weinstein domains sigma 2k, so n is at least 4. And, and k is the, the index of the infinite collection, which are all formally symplectomorphic to the standard one. But, but they're pairwise all different, pairwise all non-symplectomorphic. So again, this is saying there's some symplectic rigidity. Symplectic topology sees more than the underlying smooth topology. Um, and, and again, the way to distinguish them is that SH plus of these domains are um, all different. And you know, I think 
It's actually unknown what SH of these is, but he computes like a small part of SH of these domains, and that's enough to distinguish them. So this is some fairly intricate example, and SH of those examples is some interesting invariants. But, but schematically, like the picture to have in mind is you start with the ball, and you attach get an n minus 1 handle, and then you attach um, this, this is and then there's some complicated Legendrian kind of goes to this handle, and you attach an n handle along that. This is an n handle. This is some complicated Legendrian, which we don't actually have a description of. And uh, actually, he, he takes more and more of these. So he attaches more and more complicated Legendrians. And we don't really know what they are, but it's some presentation that's schematically like this. So like B2N, the standard structure, the zero handle, then minus one handle, canceling N handle, which are smoothly canceling, but not symplectically. And then you kind of do this some um, number of times. There's some complicated Legendre knots. Um, I'm not going to tell you what exactly its construction is, but you know there's like a whole zoo of examples, and it's kind of unclear what the structure is. So let me kind of formulate the questions that this kind of leads to, because we already see there's infinitely many of these exotic structures. If you take the standard code tangent model of the sphere, and you kind of do a boundary connect sum with these, you get infinitely many in the standard code in the code tangent model of the sphere. Um, okay, so question, classification question: What are all Weinstein domains? Which are, say, formally symplectomorphic to, say, the ball or the standard cotangent model of the sphere. I'm just doing these two examples because they have the simplest smooth topology, but you, know, you can ask this question for any smooth domain that admits some Weinstein presentation. Um, so, kind of, you, you fix the underlying smooth data and you ask what extra symplectic data. Can you get, and essentially there's going to be an infinite collection of these. But what kind of what are they? Is there some way to understand them? Well, one way to understand which domain is in terms of what Lagrangians it has. Lagrangians are important in variants like F of chi categories. So, kind of what Lagrangians? All right, let me call this domain W. What Lagrangians uh, can such W have can one of these exotic Weinstein balls or exotic cotangent bundles can I have what <coughs> SH can such W have or yeah you know, kind of how, how complicated are these domains? Maybe a more refined invariant. So here I'm just asking kind of what what is the set of Weinstein structures? We already know it's infinite, so we need some more refined understanding the set. Fortunately, there's a nice relation on the set. So there is a um, weinstein cobordism relation. So let me first write the question. What is the structure of kind of this Weinstein cobordism relation? So what I mean is what the relation Suppose you have W0 and W1, and we say that the relation is that W0 is less than W1 if W1 is obtained by starting with W0 and then kind of adding a Weinstein cobordism. So basically, you start with W. Zero, you add possibly some more handles, and then you get to W1. And in this talk, the cobordism is, go is going to be smoothly trivial, so you can stay in the same formal class. So this is some like extra structure on this, just the set of Weinstein domains. Um, and one way, okay, one motivation for studying this Weinstein cobordism relation is that um, 
if w0 is less than w1, if you have a Wenshin Kabor doesn't from w0 to w1, then Viterbo showed that um, there's a map from symplectic homology, unit low ring map from, map from symplectic homology w0, or sorry, from w1 to w0, so a contravariant map. So j holomorphic curve invariants go the other way, but they, they respect this relationship. So this is kind of a natural relationship from the point of view of uh, j holomorphic curves. Um, OK, so those are some of the questions that I am interested in. OK, so let me say a little bit about flexibility. And H principles. Okay, in my mind, these two words are kind of synonymous, but flexibility will mean a concrete thing. So I already gave one example up there, but more generally, a Weinstein domain. This is only in the high dimensional setting, and kind of the rest of this talk will only be in this high dimension where n is at least three, um, is, is flexible. Okay, now, now this is a technical term. Now this actually is going to mean something. Um, if all the n handles are attached along loose Legendrians. So in these loose Legendrians, intuitively they just they, they have some zigzag like this in in their front projections. And like I said before, any Legendrian can be made loose by adding one of these local zigzags. All right, like this is a small local modification. This one is a loose Legendrian and has a zigzag. So we'll essentially treat these zigzags as a black box. Um, but one important thing from this definition is that the same is only about the end handles. And the reason for that is that the handles uh, of index less than n are kind of symplectically not interesting. All the interesting symplectic data is in the n handles. And when you attach along a loose Legendre, the n handles are also not in very interesting. So what I'm getting at is that these flexible Weinstein domains are not kind of so interesting from the symplectic point of view. So let me say the theorem. I mean, the fact that they exist is, is super interesting. And I think that's kind of the main point. But they by themselves are not um, extremely interesting. And the reason for that is the following theorem of Chilibach and Eliashberg. So this is, this is their H principle. So there's, there's an existence portion of their result. So in order to have a Weinstein structure on a smooth domain, you, first, you definitely need a non-degenerate two-form. If you're going to have a Weinstein structure, you're going to have a symplectic structure, you're going to have a non-degenerate two-form. So non-degenerate two-form is essential. You also need to have the smooth topology of kind of a half-dimensional complex. Because if you have a Weinstein structure, then it's built up using handles of index at most n. And so the whole thing kind of retracts that half-dimensional complex. So their theorem says that those necessary conditions are, in fact, sufficient. So in high dimensions. So n is some smooth domain, some smooth domain with, with a non-degenerate two form and the homotopy type of a of a n dimensional complex so half the dimension then what they prove is w has a flexible weinstein structure so this is an existence result. They're saying some purely topological conditions here, which are necessary, are in fact sufficient if you're in this high-dimensional case. Basically, um, any 
smooth uh, embedding of a sphere can be realized by a C0 close Legendrian embedding, but, and it'll be loose. And there's also a uniqueness portion, the result, which says that if W1 and W2 are flexible, and they're formally symplectomorphic, so again, homo the, the corresponding two forms are homotopic through non-degenerate two forms, then the W1, W2 are Weinstein homotopic. So you do these handle slides and they're related. And that in fact implies that they're symplectomorphic. So kind of by themselves, these Weinstein, flexible Weinstein structures are not so interesting. Um, kind of if the underlying smooth data is the same, then they're the same. That's what this uniqueness statement is saying. And in fact, like, there's symplectic homology of any flexible one vanishes. So that's certainly compatible with the fact that there's nothing really interesting going on. Um, but what I'm going to say is just the fact that there is a theorem like this is very interesting. So let me kind of try to illustrate one consequence of this. So like I said, there's these interesting, very rich examples due to McLean. Um, kind of some complicated Legendrian. The number of handles was, was originally not known how many handles you need. Now the statement is saying that if you take these complicated Legendrians and you add a zigzag, you add this local move, then you know they're, they're still they were originally formally symplectomorphic to the ball. They're still formally symplectomorphic to the ball. Then by the uniqueness theorem, um, Chile back to the Ashberg, this is actually symplectomorphic. Weinstein homotopic to the standard ball. So once you add the zigzags, kind of all the rich invariants, this SH, everything dies, and uh, it just becomes the ball. Everything vanishes under this local move. OK. So it doesn't seem that great, but I will try to give some constructions. Uh, okay. Maybe this is not a good board. Yeah, so I think, I mean, the examples McLean constructed, they were for an at least four. For, 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 for N2, there's only one. There's no exotic Weinstein ball of where N is 2. And for N3, I think we expect there to be examples, but just like his construction did not provide any. But for N2, it's, it's not true. There's only one, actually. So it's a high dimensional phenomenon. Now, a lot of these exotic results are really high dimensional. OK. All right, so let me talk about some constructions. Via H principles. OK. Um, OK, let me start with a sample construction, which is not really the main result. But just to illustrate, so this is, this is a joint result with Eliashberg Ganatra. And the, this is going to be a construction of an exotic cotangent bundle of a sphere that contains interesting Lagrangians. Um, we know the standard cotangent bundle of a sphere, all Lagrangians, all exact Lagrangians have the same homology as Sn. This is work on nearby Lagrangian conjecture. But I'm going to construct some exotic ones, which are, which are not the sphere. So, so you have some smooth, some smooth manifold, no symplectic structure, some topological conditions that it's stably paralyzable. 
Um, it's Euler characteristic. Should be the Euler characteristic of Sn. The claim is then there exists an exotic cotangible level sphere, which I'll denote by cotangible Sn sub n sub L, which is kind of formally symplectomorphic to the standard one that contains L as a Lagrangian, exact Lagrangian. So this is cooking up for a fairly large class of smooth manifolds, exotic cotangible as a sphere with that thing as a Lagrangian. Um, and kind of infinitely many of these, infinitely many of these things, as you vary L, are, are non-symplectomorphic. OK. And again, this is just to illustrate. This is not the main result. The, the idea is that this exotic one is going to be, you start off with a cotangent bundle of L with the standard structure. But this has the wrong topology. And then you kill all the topology by adding a bunch of flexible handles. So flexible or so-called subcritical handles, which have index less than n. So you start off with cotangent bundle of L. It's the wrong topology. You want the topology to be the standard one. And then you, know, you add some handles, which are loose, and this makes the topology back to the topology of the sphere. Here, to get the topology of standard cotangible of the sphere, you use the fact that it's stably parallelizable in this other characteristic condition. Um, and I mean, the, the key, the relevant feature of flexibility here is that SH of this exotic cotangent bundle. OK, oh, let me say. So, so it has the right topology, and then you check it has the right formal class. And by construction, it will have L as a Lagrangian, just because you start off with the standard cotangent bundle of the sphere. And the other nice feature is that SH of this exotic thing is just SH of the uh, cotangent bundle of L, because adding flexible handles, this is kind of does not change SH, and this is homology of the free loop space of L. So if you find sufficiently many such L with different homology of the free loop space, you'll be able to show that you have infinitely many of these which are not symplectomorphic. Um, yeah, so that was an example of one, one way to construct exotic structures on this cotangent bundle of sphere with a nice property that L has a Lagrangian for essentially like any, any L that could be a Lagrangian for topological reasons, is in fact realized as a Lagrangian in some potentially exotic cotangent bundle sphere. OK. But maybe this is like a little bit of an example which is not that revealing. It still seems very specialized. It still seems essentially like you're just in the cotangent bundle of L and then having some other handle. So really, all the data is here. OK. Let me state the main results. So we go over here. Well, actually, these are the main questions. So maybe I'll leave that up. <coughs> okay. Okay. The main result I want to talk about. Here one. OK, so I'm going to state it for cotangent bundles of Sn, but really it works in general. So given kind of, OK, and it gives at least three, given any W1, Wk, these are Weinstein domains, which are, say, formally the same as standard cotangent bundle of the sphere. 
and again, this, this can really be anything, as long as it's the same formal class, um, then there exists sort of a maximal Weinstein structure, which is kind of also formally the same as the standard one. That, and then also, that the key statement is that it contains all Wi as Weinstein subdomains. So, so i.e., Wi is less than W at max for all i. So I start with some arbitrary collection of Weinstein structures that are exotic cotangent bundles of spheres, and I am able to produce one big one, it's like maximal one, maximal with respect to this collection that contains all of them. Um, so in particular, that says something about this weinstein cabordism relation that for any finite collection of elements, it has a maximal element. And let me just mention, kind of on the ring side, that you have uh, this Viterbo functor from SH of W max to SH of WI. And of course, for any collection of unital rings, there exists another unital ring which has a map to all of them, just the product. But this is kind of the geometric analog. OK, so let me, and there's, OK, also, we mentioned that, OK, remarks, W max is very much not unique. And in fact, the construction is not unique. And I don't know if there's like a best W max. Um, I think these are all interesting questions. Um, as far as I can tell, the construction doesn't provide a unique one. So one kind of immediate application. So I'll, I'll get to the proof of this one later. But let me first give some applications. One application. Um, So, so this is n at least three. Given any L1, LK. Again, these are smooth manifolds, closed, that are stably parallelizable. Um, the Euler characteristic relies that of the sphere. There exists some Weinstein domain which I no longer claim is, is unique. Um, this is, again, formally, it's a to the standard one that contains L1 through LK as closed, or as, as closed exact Lagrangians. So the previous example, over here, I had one L, and I produced some exotic cotangent bundle. And, it, and it, was a, it was a fairly straightforward construction. You know, you start with cotangent bundle, and you had all these flexible handles. Here I'm saying you can, you can do it for any finite collection. Given any finite collection of such LIs, you can construct the cotangent bundle that contains all of them. And the proof is just you start with each of these things constructed from before. And they're kind of ex by this theorem one, there exists this W max containing each of these cotangent bundles of Li, and Li will be in here, so it's in here. So you take the pieces from before, and you um, apply this result to each of those exotic cotangent bundles of the sphere. This maximal one will contain all of them. But as we'll see, the construction of this one is actually already not explicit at all. And I have no idea kind of what this W max is. So the mystery of the H principle kind of remains. Um, so that's one application. So these are exotic cotangent bundles of spheres with kind of as many Lagrangians as you want with like different topology. Um, I think this is kind of a new construction. Um, what can I erase?
let me give a related construction. Another result along the same lines, um, which is maybe a little bit more interesting, is that there exists an exotic cotangent bundle of a sphere, which I'll denote by sub, sub k, with k Lagrangian spheres. Um, which are embedded, and they're smoothly isotopic, but not Hamiltonian isotopic. So in the previous case, we constructed exotic cotangent bundles with many Lagrangians with different topology. Here I'm saying you can even fix the topology. The Lagrangians are all spheres, and they're all smoothly isotopic, but they're not Hamiltonian isotopic. So let me, let me sketch a proof of this result. The, the way I'm going to distinguish these spheres is there's going to be one Lagrangian disk, and they're going to have different um, wrapped floor homology with that disk, and so they have to be not Hamiltonian isotopic. So this is going to be a sketch. But, but the, main, the main point is that it kind of just uses theorem one and kind of as a, almost as a black box. You essentially like, don't really need to know that much. Um, let me say that the starting point is that there exists Lagrangian disks, dn sub k, in the standard cotangent bundle of a sphere. Um, so that this wrapped floor homology of these different disks with the zero section are, are different for different k. This was, as far as I can tell, this was originally an observation of Abu Zaid and Seidel. I mean, these, these disks are kind of essentially graphs of Oh, this, this is wrapped floor homology. Or, okay, fine. I, I don't know what notation exactly is. W, w H, wrapped floor homology. You have, okay, but now you're starting with a standard cotangent bundle sphere, and you have some infinite collection of disks there, constructed by Abzid and Seidel. It's not so difficult to construct these. You take the, the graph of some function, um, and the wrapped floor homology is kind of the more homology of that function. Or, relative to like very negative sublevel sets. So this is some very explicit thing. I'm going to say how to use these disks to construct an exotic cotangent bundle with different spheres. So the, the idea is that kind of by kind of a relative version of theorem 1, there exists kind of a maximal WD. This is some exotic Munchy domain, exotic cotangent, or exotic cotangent bundle sphere, some exotic disk such that all of these other, the, the standard cotangent bundle with this, this disk. Oh, the disks are all kind of smoothly isotopic, let me say. So that there's you know, a Weinstein cobordism kind of even relative to the disk. You, you attach some handles to this domain to get this, and the disk kind of extends, these different disks extend to this disk. So this is WK. This is basically relative version of theorem 1. So this, this one is kind of the maximal. Like if you, if you look at all of these for, for different k's, you apply the maximal construction, you get this one big one. Um, and now the point is that um, the, the claim, which I'm not going to quite prove, oh, okay. that this wrapped floor homology of 
the image of the zero section in, in W with, with, this, with this D is just kind of what it was on the pre-image. So this is kind of computed in W. It is just what it is in the zero section in here. But this disk in the standard, kind of the pre-image of the disk in the standard cotangent bundle of a sphere is, is this DK. And, this, and by, by, you know, by assumption, um, wrap homology of the zero section with this DK are, these, these are all different. So, so, so the, what I'm saying is these, um, these S1 through SKs that I referred to above are just the image of uh, IK of uh, the zero section under this maximal embedding. And they have, they're smoothly isotopic, and they're not Hamiltonian isotopic to each other because they have different wrap flow homology with this one big disk. So you're essentially transferring the data of one, all these exotic disks in the standard cotangent bundle to the information of kind of non Hamiltonian isotopic spheres in this exotic cotangent bundle. I'm sorry, why did they smoothly isotopic? Well, I, I didn't prove that, but essentially it follows from the fact that the disks were smoothly isotopic. I mean, this is some, uh, yeah, th there's definitely something to check there, but I would say the main point is that the wrap floor homology, the image of these, with this disk is the same as the zero section with this disk by construction, because you have, you have these disks here in the standard cotangent bundle, and they you have different embeddings of this thing into this mysterious W, so that this disk kind of extends up to this big disk D. And down here, you had the zero section. So you use like a maximal principle in order to prove this result. But, but this maximal construction, that's like really the key. I'm not saying this W, where did I write it? Oh, this, this is my W, is unique. I'm trying to give like kind of a general proof of that this thing can be constructed, and it doesn't really require much work beyond some flexibility results. OK, let me, so those are the two main applications. So basically, cotangent bundles, exotic cotangent bundles could have lots of Lagrangians. And the different topologies, or same smooth topology, but not Hamiltonian isotopic. And the proofs are somehow flexible. Um, OK, now let me talk about the proof of theorem one, this maximal construction, which is the main theorem. OK. Okay, I guess I can. Okay. So so theorem one was kind of a maximal construction. You start with some domains, and you cook up a maximal domain containing them. So oddly enough, the proof of this maximal construction involves a minimal construction. So you need to study minimal structures. So theorem one is going to depend on the following results. The claim is that. Any Weinstein structure, and as at least three, can be Weinstein homotoped to a kind of the, the flexible structure that's formally isotopic. So basically, this one is you look at the structure and you add zigzags to each of the handles, and then you attach some Weinstein cobordism. As it turns out, the Weinstein cobordism can be made to have just two handles. Um, so let me try to explain this result. This is basically saying that you know, any Weinstein domain W can be decomposed into kind of a, the, the flexible part, and then a part, OK, oh yeah, sorry, these two handles 
are sm smoothly, this is a smoothly trivial cobordism. Plus these like two handles. And this, this end handle is kind of where all of the data of the Weinstein domain goes into. So, so down here, you have a part which is flexible. So it's not interesting from the symplectic point of view, but all the interesting smooth topologies down here, so this is symplectically interesting, or sorry, uh, sim okay. smoothly interesting, all the smooth topologies there. Interesting. But not, but not symplectically interesting because it's flexible. On the other hand, you have this uh, smoothly trivial cobordism. Smoothly trivial, so, but it's it's where all the symplectic information lies. So it's symplectically interesting. Smoothly trivial. So. You kind of decompose an arbitrary Weinstein domain. You kind of split up. You kind of filter out the, the smooth data, and you separate that out from the flexible data. That's kind of what this is saying. And as a, as a nice, OK, so, so what this is also saying is that this W flex is minimal with respect to the weinstein cobordism relation. Any, so, so any W, you have the flexible version. And then you have any W here. OK, it also turns out that, um, well, if you change the topology, you can have things smaller than W flex. You can have non flexible domains living inside of a flexible domain. So, but let me just say that this theorem is saying that any W, there's W flex, and it's less than, so it's minimal element in this relationship. Um, so, so, W flex is minimal. OK, so let me sketch a proof of this result. Um, let me get that result up. Um, OK, proof sketch of theorem 2. And the, the main idea here is to do some handle slides. Um, so smooth topology, okay, you have two handles with the same index attached along some Legendrians, or they will be attached along some Legendrians. You first attach a handle along this, and now you slide this attaching sphere over this handle, so it kind of engulfs this handle, and you get something that looks like Kind of this one's engulfed like this. You kind of start sliding over and eventually gets back to the same level set. So is this is this picture? Okay, let me maybe if I draw it horizontally it's it's easier. So this one gets engulfed, it goes over, and that's the handle side. And it turns out there's a Legendrian analog of this. This is this was figured out by Castles and Murphy. They figured out the Legendrian analog. And essentially, what's going on here, you have the, the key is that suppose you know, this is the purely local operation. I, I'm looking at this part, these two parallel um, branches, and I'm supposing the Legendrian, this, that's what this is referred to. The handle slide over this Legendrian replaces this one with, with this Legendrian. Oh, sorry. This is the front projection. So just like over here, um, I have this one, and the, the top one got replaced with something like this. The, or I guess maybe going down under with the Legendre analog is this. And the point is that when you do a handle slide, this is a Weinstein homotopy move. Um, so it just changes the presentation, but it, you know, the symplectic structure is still the same. And OK, the, the key insight is that, well, so don't have much room, that you, you want to do handle slides in a way that makes all of the Legendrians loose, except for one of them that you're handle sliding over. So the, the, the main idea is really 
you first expose your hand on sliding over this one, you do a Legendrian isotopy. You do this Reitermeister move. These, this is all in the front projection, so these two Legendrians are isotopic. And then, and then you do the handle slide. And wh what you get is, you know, you use this chart, and what you get is this picture. And this picture, it already has the loose Legendre. This you already has the zigzag right here. Right? So what I I just did the Schreitermeister move, and then I did the uh, the handle slide using this as the local chart, and that's what uh, the result of Castles and Murphy tells us. It is, but the point is, this Legendre now is loose, right? This, th here's the zigzag. And so if I pick one handle, I slide all of the other ones over that handle, all of those other ones will become loose, and I still have this extra handle right there. And that's how I get that you got a flexible thing with this n minus 1 handle. And uh, these are kind of all of the other handles that it became loose. And this is the extra handle right here, which they all slid over. But, but the, maybe the key point is that you know, even though this one is loose, it's not loose in the complement of, th of this one. And you have to consider all the attaching spheres as one link. And as a link, you know, essentially this one has like the same bit of information as this one. The information is not lost because even though this is loose, you still have this one and it's cutting through the loose chart. So it's not actually loose once you attach that handle. Um, okay. And so let me mention one side application of this result, um, this theorem too. So this is saying any Weinstein I mean, W of high dimensions, right? Suppose you have a Weinstein presentation. You, you're allowed to do some handle slides. You're allowed to do some handle cancellations um, in the Weinstein setting. What is the fewest number of handles you can get, right? You can, um, the number of handles you can get is definitely uh, at least as big as the number of smooth handles you can get. But are there cases where the number of Weinstein handles uh, are strictly bigger. It turns out the answer is yes. You know, for these exotic Weinstein balls, you definitely need some n handles because that's where the symplectic topology really comes in. But this result is basically going to say that any Weinstein domain W has a Weinstein presentation um, with at most two more handles. than a smooth presentation. So right, a Weinstein presentation, number of, the minimum number of handles is definitely at, most, uh, at least as big as the number of smooth handles you need. But, you know, can it be arbitrarily large? This is saying, no, the minimum number that you need is at most two more. And the proof of that is just because you can decompose W into this flexible piece plus these two handles. So this flexible piece, you can cancel all the handles that you could smoothly. You get the minimum number here, but then you might need these two more handles, and that's where the symplectic topology um, remains. So this is, this is some kind of handle cancellation procedure, um, kind of like in the H-cobordism theorem, but it's, you know, it's not quite as good. You can't kill all the handles that you could smoothly. Um, but of course, that you, you know you can't kill all the handles smoothly, because Otherwise, it would be no simple topology. OK, so, so that was theorem two, this minimal structures and an application, side application. Let me explain how to use theorem two to prove theorem one, so how to go from minimum to maximum. Um, Okay. 
Okay, so, so proof of theorem one. Let me recall that you have all these exotic Weinstein cotangent bundles of spheres. And again, th this really works in any setting as long as you fix the formal symplectomorphism type. So by, by th and, and you want to cook up this maximal one, which has the same topology. I mean, the, the key statement is that the maximal one also has the same topology. It's not hard to cook up some maximal one with different topology that contains all of them. You just take the boundary and connect it so. If you want to preserve the topology, that's, that's the, the, the harder part, I think. So you have all of these. You want to cook up a maximal one. And so by theorem 2, each of these WIs are Weinstein homotopic to the flexible version of them plus some um, some two some two handles. I mean, essentially, the important thing is it's a smoothly trivial Weinstein cobordism here. But but because these were formally symplectomorphic and these these are all flexible, the the W I's flexes are all. Weinstein homotopic, right? The WIs were not, but the flexible versions are, because you, you got loose charts everywhere, and uh, all the simplex data is killed. And because they're formally the same, they become Weinstein homotopic. So, so now you identify all of these pieces. You, have, you essentially have WI, and you have this flexible version of W. You, know, you identify all these pieces. Plus, you have these two handles. All right, so you had some, some complicated Legendrian. You had this WI flex, and then you had like WJ flex, complicated Legendrian, and now you, you identify these two pieces by the H cobordism. You glue them together. So you can view the whole picture as living in just W flex. Now, now the key thing will be that, all right, so now, now I, I identify them. Now I have W flex, and I have, OK, I think extra colors will be good. And I have a bunch of handles. You know, I have the, I identify these, and I just see where do these handles go. So these handles go, uh, these, this handle goes to some handle here. This handle goes to some, all right, this, this was this handle. Uh, these colors are not really. This blue one is like. Yeah, so you can tell I'm a real Yasha student. Um, <laughs> stuff my pictures. Um, so, but but the key statement is that all of these Legendrians are are disjoint. Um, so, right. This is just essentially for dimension reasons. The dimension of lambda i. This is n minus 1. The dimension of lambda j, well, it's in fact at most n minus 1. Whereas the dimension of the ambient contact structure, this boundary of W flex, is 2n minus i. And this, this is 2n minus 2, which is less than 2n minus i. All I'm saying is if you have two Legendrians in one contact manifold, you can do a Legendrian isotopy so that they become disjoint. And once, once they're disjoint, you can attach handles to all of them. So this W max will just be W flex plus essentially all of the handles. So we go one. Where I possibly perturb them so that they're disjoint. So you know, I, I had these two pieces. I identified the bottom parts using the minimality, and then I have this part fixed, and I have all of the other Legendrians I need to attach, and I attach them all at the same time. And this is what I'm going to call W max. Right, so the, the claim is W max will contain all of the WIs. Well, well where, where's, where's W1? W1 is just kind of this, this portion right here that was like these handles. And then I attach some more handles, namely the image of these handles to get W max. 
where, where's, where's W2? W2 is just these handles. So, and then, so you have W2, which is this portion, that maps into here, and W1, which is this portion, that maps into here. So the, the schematic picture you should have in mind is I have this common subdomain W flex. I have this part is, is W1, this part is W2, and the whole thing is this W max. And what is the cohort? And it has W1 in it. And what is the cohortism from W1 to W max? It's just I look at the handles that I used to build W2, but after I attach these handles. So here's the minimal element, and I have here the maximal element. So really, the kind of if you think about this one to cohortism relation, I have W flex as the minimal element. I have W1 kind of less than this. I have W2 less than this, and then my, this W max is just kind of what I get by combining all of the handles. So that's the construction of this W max. And let me say that this W max will, will very much, it's very much not unique. I mean, the, the whole game is I have some, some Legendre in here, and I have some other Legendre in here, and I'm supposed to attach handles along both of them. And that's my W max. But, but I could also kind of perturb this Legendre in some other way. And then I could apply the maximal construction to, to this thing as a link. It will still contain W1 in it and W2 in it. But the whole domain I get will depend on the choice of linking data here. So essentially, the W maxes I get are as complicated as like, the possible linkings between two Legendrians that are like in the right Legendre and isotopy class by themselves, but I can link them in however way I can separately. Yeah, so, so, so one remark, this W max is, is not unique. Um, and let me mention another mark, that the fact that W minus this W flex is Weinstein Is, is a crucial part of this argument. Because what was the argument? The argument was I had this W flex, and I had kind of this Weinstein cohortism here, which is W1, and I had kind of another Weinstein cohortism here, which was W2, and I was supposed to attach all of the handles at once, which I can do because Legendrians are generically disjoint. But if this were some Louisville cohortism, and this were some Louisville cohortism, even if it were smoothly trivial, I wouldn't know how to attach both of them at the same time along the same negative end. I really need this handle decomposition so that kind of the cohortisms changes some plexic structures in distinct regions, and so I can throw everything in at the same time. So I don't know how to do this with Louisville um, domains. OK, so I think I'm out of time. Let me just say that essentially everything that I've said here works in the contact setting. There's an analog of flexible Weinstein structures. There's a context analog of this like minimal element. You can cook up the maximal construction. And there's other applications there. So I think this is a good place to stop.